The following podcast is a ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church. Here now the word of the Lord as it is found in 1 John chapter 5. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves whomever has been born of Him. And by by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The first five verses of 1 John chapter 5 we have what is, in a sense, a summation of everything that John has been saying up to this point in his letter. He brings it all together and he essentially says all of these disparate subjects that we've been discussing, they're actually all one thing. So as we come to this summation Uh, Let's pray that the Lord would open our eyes so that we can see that one thing. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word and for uh, revealing yourself to us and revealing to us uh, the wonder of your redemption from start to finish, from eternity past to eternity future. We pray uh, that you would settle in our hearts this one thing the gospel, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Years ago, when I was a young, aspiring writer, I discovered an incredibly diverse and prolific author. His name is is Lawrence Block. He's the author of Several minor classics like Eight Million Ways to Die, A Walk Among the Tombstones, and Like a Lamb to the Slaughter. But he wrote in a whole host of different genres. Uh, For instance, he has his Matt Scudder detective novels, kind of hard-boiled detective fiction. Uh, Then he has these sort of Robin Hood-like heist novels featuring a character named Bernie Rodenbar who only steals from really bad people and then solves crimes that the police can't solve uh, putting those really bad people away for good while Bernie gets to keep the stuff. Uh, Then there's the Evan Tanner spy novel series. Evan Tanner had a shrapnel wound uh, that uh, caused him to no longer be able to sleep. And so while everyone else is sleeping, he's teaching him things, uh, himself things like uh, the cello or how to speak Czech. And uh, so he has this prolific knowledge of everything in the world. And of course, he saves the world from nuclear crisis every single novel. Uh, and then I, I discovered that he was also a columnist Uh, for Writer's Digest magazine. And he gave advice about how to write well, particularly uh, his uh, primary area, which was detective fiction. Uh, The title of his regular column was Telling Lies for Fun and Profit. Uh, This is what he said in one of his classic columns. History is the key to mystery. It doesn't matter whether you're a detective trying to solve a crime or a scientist trying to discover a breakthrough or just a parent trying to understand your child. 
piecing together the sequence of events and then filling in the chronological gaps in the story is the first step in unraveling any knotted tangle of a problem. History is the key to mystery. When it comes to the mystery of God, this is exactly what theologians do all the time. Uh, they, they, they attempt to identify some sequence, some logical order. Uh, theologians often speak of, for instance, the historia salutis and of the ordo salutis. Uh, the historia salutis is simply the history of salvation. It's It's the primary story of the Bible. It's the narrative of God's redemptive purposes from his decrees in eternity past all the way through to the fulfillment of all of his promises in eternity future. It's the account of what Jesus accomplished on our behalf with his finished work from his incarnation to his life uh, to his crucifixion uh, when he is uh, killed by uh, the means of execution that should have rightly been ours. And then he's raised from the dead, and uh, then he ascends to the right hand of the Father, uh, where even now, in union with him, he affords us his glory. This is the Historia Salutis. And by understanding that history, we unlock much mystery. Now, the Ordo Salutis, on the other hand, <clears throat> is the order or the sequence of salvation. It's, it's not really a chronology or a series of timed events. Instead, it's sort of the theological or logical progression of God's redemptive purposes for us. So, We know that first God calls us and then he produces regeneration in us so that we respond to his call with repentance and faith and then eventually obedience. And behind this divine call is God's electing decree before the foundation of the world. This is the Ordo Salutis. This comprehensive, multifaceted uh, faceted, uh, working of God is declared to us in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 1, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. But it's particularly clear in Romans chapter 8. Remember this passage? This is what we read. For we know that for those who love God, All things work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of a son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Here the Apostle Paul tells us that God foreknew us and predestined us to be conformed to the image of his Son. And then he affords us grace to believe, to repent, to obey, to grow in Christ, to mature, to to move on to holiness, and then eventually to be glorified. Thus, if you break it up, as theologians often do, the Ordo Salutis is first, election or predestination, second, atonement, third, gospel call, fourth, that inward call, fifth, regeneration, sixth, conversion by faith and repentance, seventh, justification, eighth, sanctification, and finally, ninth, glorification. Now, The value in knowing this history is that it unlocks the mystery of redemption itself because it frees us from the presumption of works righteousness or or even some sort of cooperative synergy uh, where we work with God in our redemption. 
In other words, the Ordo Salutis, this history of redemption, enables us to say God is the one who saves and God supplies all our needs from the first to the last. It's the Ordo Salutis, knowing this glorious history, that enables us to say, not, I found Jesus, but Jesus found me. (laughs) Glory to God. And that is exactly what John is driving home in this passage. He wants us to see from the first to the last that this history unlocks a glorious mystery that grace is all we need. He's given us grace to believe. He's given us grace to love. He's given us grace to obey. He has given us grace to overcome the world. Now, in order for us to see this, we probably need to uh, to clear away a few weeds. This is actually somewhat of a complex passage uh, grammatically, but it also is a sort of a repetition of themes that we have already seen from the beginning of the book. Uh, Evidences uh, that John gives us over and over again in order to establish us in our blessed assurance. Did you recognize the themes? Uh, Let's just review a little bit. In chapter 2 of John's letter, he talks about obedience in verses 3 through 6. Love in verses 7 through 11. Faith and belief in verses 18 to 27. And overcoming the world in verses 13 through 17. In chapter 3... He, very familiarly, talks about obedience in verses 1 through 10, love in verses 11 through 18, faith and belief in verse 23, and overcoming the world in verses 19 through 22. In chapter 4, he talks about Obedience in verses 13 through 21, love in verses 7 through 12, faith and belief in verses 1 through 6, and overcoming the world in verses 4 and 5. So again, in chapter 5, he hits on these essential themes. Here's how we can know that we abide in Christ and Christ abides in us. Here is how we can know blessed assurance. Obedience, verses 2 and 3. Love, verses 1, 2 and 3. Faith and belief, verses 1, 4 and 5. And overcoming the world, verses 4 and 5. Now, John Stott uh, tells us that this is a very, very deliberate rhetorical teaching tool that John uses. Uh, This is the way uh, Stott puts it. What John is at pains to show is the essential unity of his thesis. He has not chosen these evidences arbitrarily or at random and stuck them together artificially. On the contrary, he shows us that they are so closely woven together into a single coherent fabric that it is difficult to unpick and disentangle the threads. We cannot believe in Jesus Christ without loving the Father and without loving his children. We cannot love the Father and love his children without obeying his commands and overcoming the world. And we cannot overcome the world without coming full circle to believing in Jesus Christ. What John is doing here is he's reinforcing this extraordinary notion that faith and belief, that loving those who are difficult to love, that obeying all of the commands of God, that are calling in the world to overcome the world, that all of these things are actually just one thing. Now, to reinforce that, I want, to, uh, I want to do something that you'll probably be a little irritated with because you probably thought diagramming sentences was something that you left behind in fourth grade. But I'm going to make you, uh, 
I'm, I'm going to make you kind of recall some of your grammatical knowledge. Notice the verb tenses, particularly in verse 1 and verse 4. Verse 1, John tells us, everyone who believes, that's present tense, has been born, that's past tense. And then uh, we see uh, love for the Father, everyone who loves the Father must also love those the Father loves. That's present tense. But those who do are those who have been born of God. Past tense. Look for uh, verse 4. Those who have been born, past tense, are those who are able to overcome present tense the world. Now, what's going on here is uh, actually a little more complicated than just present tense and past tense. Uh, The past tense here is actually something called past perfect. Past perfect is used to indicate an action that actually has occurred in the past, while at the same time pointing uh, to or focusing attention on something in the present. In other words, it's looking at the result of an action rather than the action or the occurrence itself. So, for example, I might say, I have studied for this sermon. And by that, you will know, I've given you enough information for you to know about a prior action. Earlier this week, I studied But the point of me telling you that I studied is not for you to focus on the study, but for you to realize, ah, okay, he's not winging it. (laughs) He's actually ready to to preach this sermon. Uh, So it's something that occurred in the past, but it points to something in the present. Now, notice what John is doing. This is a stunning revelation. These evidences which are the ground of our blessed assurance, obedience, love, faith, and believing, and then finally, overcoming the world are all the results of a prior action. The new birth. This is, again, what John Stott says. He says, the real link between all of these evidences is to be seen in the new birth. Faith, love, obedience, and overcoming the world are all the natural growth which follows a birth from above. They are evidences of the mutual indwelling of God and his people. We abide in him, he abides in us. The combination of the present tense and the past perfect is important. It shows clearly that believing is the consequence, not the cause of the new birth. Our present continuing activity of believing is the result and therefore the evidence of our past experience of the new birth by which we became and remain God's children. See what he's saying here? There's evidence in our lives. Faith. Belief. And that faith and belief are the results of the new birth. Faith and belief don't give us the new birth. The new birth is what gives us faith and belief. But at the same time, the very thing that that prompts, that gives birth, that is the genesis of our redemption is simultaneously what prompts, gives birth, is the genesis of our obedience, our walking together. It is grace that brings us to salvation. It is grace that enables us to love those that we think are unlovable. It is grace that enables us to obey the word of God so that his commands are not burdensome to us. 
It is grace from first to last. This is how Calvin puts it. He simply says, the commandments of God are not burdensome to those born of God. The love of the brethren flows forth from the love of God. The love of God flows forth from the life of God, begotten in us by the grace of God, which is in turn the means by which we come to believe and are thereby regenerated. From first to last, it is all of grace. So now, back to this passage, let's see if we can see this order, this, uh, this history that unlocks the mystery. Verse 1, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ was first born of God. In fact, it's not possible to love the Father or to love those that the Father loves apart from this new birth. Verse 2, uh, this is evidenced by our love for the children of God and obedience to his commands. Verse 3, because that is the love of God. It's the love of God that we keep his commands. And that's why obedience is our happy choice and why his commands are not burdensome to us. Verse 4, this is the means by which we overcome the world, not in our strength, not by our ingenuity, not by our cunning or our resolve, but by the faith that he gave us in the first place. And so faith is our victory. Verse 5, believing that Jesus is the Son of God is overcoming the world. How many Christians do you know who struggle trying to figure out just how to walk rightly, to overcome plaguing sins, to have hope in the midst of a seemingly hopeless world, uh, to to deal with uh, personality traits that have plagued us uh, from the time we were children. Uh, When God says, I've given you grace, for this. The same grace that you received at redemption is the grace that you have progressively day by day in sanctification. Hilaire Belloc says this, to understand the nature of something, one must reckon with its history and its origin. How something comes to be at the first shapes what it will be at the last. We are saved by grace, through faith, this not of ourselves. This is uh, why uh, very quickly the Apostle Paul declares to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 2 verse 6, In the same way you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so continue to walk in him. This is what Paul is talking about in Galatians chapter 5. He says, if we live by the Spirit... And, of course, we do. It is in him that we live and breathe and have our being. So he says, if this is true, then let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Now, now, that's not works righteousness. That's not synergistic cooperation with God. He's simply saying there that if you really are Born of the Spirit, if you live of the Spirit, then put yourself in the way of grace. He's given you grace for everything that you need. Put yourself in the way of grace. Keep in step with the Spirit. Let's uh, let's break this down to its simplest uh, and, and, and most comprehensible sense. Uh, Karen's always telling me, make sure you put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Uh, so here are the cookies on the bottom shelf. God has given us grace to believe. God has given us grace to love. God has given us grace to obey. God has given us grace to overcome. 
God gave us grace to bring us to him. Therefore, you have grace for today. Whatever it is that you're facing, whatever adversity, whatever difficulty, whatever discouragement, whatever great challenge, God has given you grace for today. And if he's given you grace for today, the only thing you're responsible for is doing the next right thing as you walk in grace. And if you do the next right thing as you walk in grace, then he will give you grace for tomorrow. And all of tomorrow's tomorrows. As Christians, we've been given the means of grace. How many Christians do you know who, when they are in turmoil abandon the very things that God has given us to sustain us. God's word, for instance. We need to be a people of the word. Reading God's word, studying God's word, memorizing God's word, singing God's word, texting God's word to one another as as encouragement. We need to... Uh, surround ourselves with God's word at every turn because this is the means by which he communicates to us the glorious message of truth and his wondrous grace. It's also why we need each other. We need each other because uh, the body of Christ is made up of many, many different parts of one body. And we all need the various functioning parts of the body to encourage us, to uphold us, to challenge us, uh, to bring teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness to us at exactly the right times uh, to make, make us look another human being in the eye so that we are actually honest with one another. We need each other. This is a means of grace. We need the worship of the living God. To abandon worship at a time when we are distressed or exhausted or don't know how we can go forward is the dying, starving man refusing the very meal that would save his life. We need to come to the table of of grace. Uh, We need to hear the proclamation of grace. Uh, We need to know that there is a means of grace. If we live by the Spirit, so we must also keep in step with the Spirit. This is how Thomas Chalmers put it, that as he discussed the the, the, the seemingly overwhelming passage that we just read a little while ago from John chapter 14. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. Th- this is what Chalmers said. We know of no way by which to keep the love of the world out of our hearts than to keep in our hearts the love of God. And no other way by which to keep our hearts in the love of God than by building them ourselves on the most holy faith. Faith worketh by love, and love is made manifest as it walketh faith. Therefore, I must need the means of grace at every turn. We sing it. All the time. And when we sing it, we probably don't think another thing about it. My shepherd will supply my need. All my needs. My my needs today, my needs tomorrow. So why do I fret? Am I fixed on circumstances or have I failed to fix on the provision that God has made for me. My shepherd will supply my need. Jehovah is his name. The O oh, may uh, thy house be my abode and all my work praise. He brings my wandering spirit back when I forsake his ways. 
the Holy Ghost, dispel our sadness, pierce the clouds of sinful night. The calm, O source of sweetest gladness, breathe your life and spread your light. It's everywhere. It's the one thing. When we understand the history, the unfolding of God's grace from start to finish, that, that necessarily unlocks the mystery of how we walk together. John is uh, simply saying, his commandments are not burdensome. Because faith, which he has already given us, is the means by which we overcome the world. Faith is our victory. And we have faith by grace. Therefore, we have victory in the midst of the world. Grace to believe. Grace to love. Grace to obey. Grace to overcome the world. May God work in us his powerful working to apprehend that the gospel is not just a fire insurance policy. It is life. It is everything. It's the one thing. This has been the Parish Presbyterian Church Sermon Podcast. For more information about the ministry of Parish Presbyterian Church, please visit www.parishpres.org.